several centuries ago, someone wrote a story <coughs> about someone, hard to say who, who left a house at night left the house at night and went outside and uh, met with a lover and was forgotten among the lilies. Does anyone know who wrote that? Anyone happen to know who wrote that story? One of the great poems ever written. Yes, it was St. John. St. John wrote a story about that. Ends with Forgotten Among the Lilies. It's a story about the spiritual path. And the end of that spiritual path, as he discusses it in that poem, is being forgotten among the lilies. Isn't that nice? Very beautiful poem. Yes. And uh, we just uh, had a chance to listen to a story about someone who uh, loves her husband and loves nature and therefore with her husband wanted to observe the beauty of nature and uh, it was said in that piece one of the storytellers said I'm afraid that if everyone is like her, then the beauty of nature will not survive in its majesty, its current majesty. And I thought that phrase, everyone were like her, was such an interesting phrase to me. Because what sort of person is she, after all? She's a sort of person uh, who loves her family and nature. That's a confusing story, isn't it? Such a confusing story. Because she was clear. She was absolutely clear, and I think, in fact, she's right. I don't disagree with her. But what sort of person is she? Well, she's the sort of person who loves her family and nature. She's a wonderful person. And yet, it is said, someone feels, Jack feels, that uh, if everyone were like her, then the beauty of nature would suffer. And he said further, it's important that we're willing to disappear sometimes. It's important that occasionally, at least, we are forgotten among the lilies. That we forget ourselves. That we forget ourselves in the beauty of nature so that it is not the case that we're using the beauty of nature in order to make ourselves happy, but in fact that we forget ourselves and find a kind of happiness that's independent of all conditions. It's a fascinating story to me. Uh, it's 
a story that includes the significance of human beings having a positive impact on the world. We hear about hundreds of thousands of dollars and hours spent in order to care for the whooping crane, a species that I have a particular affinity with because of my own family history. My father was very much involved in the uh, the preservation of and the support of the whooping crane. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's a difficult, it's an uphill journey to save a species like that. It's an uphill journey to save so many species on this planet. It's an uphill journey <coughs> because it's so hard for us to disappear. And it's so confusing because those people who are raising the whooping cranes have obviously not disappeared. They have an airplane that they made in order to guide the whooping cranes hither and thither. They've obviously not disappeared. And yet, they're making the statement that it's important for us to be willing to disappear. So it's confusing. Why is it confusing? It's confusing because it's real. And because the real world doesn't always fit into our simple opinions. So we're left with the importance of this question, how can we disappear? How can we at least be able to disappear? How can we be able to disappear? Now, of course it isn't necessary for us to invariably disappear. In fact, that might not be advisable. Now, you know me. Uh, if you came up to me and you said, hey, I decided to stop doing whatever I'm doing here, whatever we're all doing here, and I'm going to go and live in a cave in the mountains and not interact with anyone anymore and just experience the bliss of emptiness. Uh, I would think that was a great idea. I think that's wonderful. I've done that now and then for relatively short periods of time, just a few months at a time. And it's been great. It's been just fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, both of the happiest periods of my life have been uh, living under those circumstances. It's a wonderful thing to do. And furthermore, I don't think it's such an open and shut case about whether a person who does that is doing uh, something that benefits the world. Because we have to admit that if we're doing anything, we're, we're doing in, in the modern world, if we're engaging in the modern world structures, then to a certain extent we're doing some harm. And uh, to remove ourselves from that harm is itself a benefit. So there's value in that. There's value in us just coming here and sitting down and not doing anything. And we can do that for hours or months or years or decades, and there's still value in that. There is value. Uh, it's very important to, to see that there is value. And there's value in being in the modern society, in doing our best to impact the modern society, in doing good work. Uh, talked about St. John. He talks about self-forgetting, which is the significance of being forgotten among the lilies. He himself has forgotten himself. Who, who forgot him? Well, he did. There's nothing left, just lilies. The beauty of the lilies is all that remains. But he isn't the only person who at that time in Christian Europe was talking about self-forgetting. Who's the person who is traditionally said to be even better than him at talking about self-forgetting? 
the Catholic Church at least feels that she was even more eloquent on this topic than St. John, despite the fact that St. John was magnificent in his eloquence. I'm sure someone knows, so you can just say it. St. Teresa. St. Teresa, yes. St. Teresa talked quite a bit about self-forgetting. She said that it's the absolute pinnacle of the spiritual path. A complete self-forgetting. A complete self-forgetting. It is the pinnacle of this path to have that experience of total self-forgetting. Or, as it was said uh, by a person named Buddha Gosha a few centuries before, although it's almost certain, virtually certain, that St. John and St. Teresa had no awareness of his work, Buddha Gosha wrote something very similar uh, in his work, the Vasudhimagga said something very similar, we experience non-self. We actually experience non-self. We experience selflessness. We have an experience in which self is not present. And then, a few centuries later than that, in Japan, the great Zen master Dogen wrote, to study the way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. Quoted almost constantly in Japanese Zen, that phrase. To study the way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. And so we see a theme. We see a theme through world spiritual traditions about the importance of being able to, quote, disappear. And we saw that theme today. And this time, it isn't some monk or nun cloistered away. Uh, at least as cloistered as, as they could be. St. John uh, certainly wished he was more cloistered than he was. Because even while he was cloistered in his room, the demons still came to do battle with him. Uh, maybe some of you know about that. He had epic battles in his room, in his meditation practice, with the demons who had come to the beasts beside the path. Uh, so he wished he was cloistered from those distractions as well, but he wasn't. In any case, these folks, the four who we're talking about, are relatively cloistered, and we're not as cloistered. On the contrary, we're deeply involved in the goings-on of the world. And so one might ask, so why, why would it be important for us to know how to disappear also? Of course, they can disappear. They're off in their little room, far away, not impacting the world. And so they disappear and experience the joy of absolute freedom, so good for them. But here I am in my life trying to make an impact, trying to do good in the world. Of course, that's why I'm here. I'm here to do good. That's, otherwise, I'd go to a cave experience the bliss of emptiness and be happy for the rest of my life. And on the contrary, here I am, struggling with the circumstances of the world. Why? Why? Well, because I'm trying to make a difference. That's why. Those monks and nuns, it's great that they're off doing their thing, alone. In action, non-doing, uh, is their art. And, it, and they're mastering that art, and it's wonderful that they are. But that isn't my art. My art is called behavior. My religion is called behavior. My behavior is my religion. Isn't it? That's what we're doing. Here we are, behaving. We're in the world. We're making an impact. We're doing stuff. We're changing things. We're thinking things. We're saying things. We're doing things. And in that way, we're impacting the world. It's our behavior. What we do is our religion, is our practice. Isn't it? As far as I'm concerned, it ought to be. We're doing stuff. And so what we do should be beautiful. What we do should be our spirituality. It shouldn't just be the path of our spirituality. It should be the manifestation of our spirituality. What we do each day, the way we get up, the way we eat our breakfast, the way we interact with others, the way we go to bed, all of that needs to be a manifestation of our spiritual practice. Of course. And in fact, 
far as I'm concerned, whether we want it to be that or not, it still is that. <laughs> it still is that. It is a manifestation of who we are, of what we're practicing, of what we're studying. What we do is that. And so our behavior here, people in the world, our behavior is our spiritual practice. And so you might ask, so why would it be important for someone whose behavior, what we do, is our spiritual practice? Why would it be important for us to be able to disappear? Why is that important? So you can answer in a certain way. You can say, well, for this reason, if you want to raise whooping cranes, then you shouldn't look like a person, so you put on a costume, and they think that you're a bird, and then you, quote, disappeared in your airplane and disappear, <laughs> guide them down to Florida without them knowing that you did it. That's true. It's not untrue. It's a kind of disappearing, but it isn't the kind of disappearing that we were practicing this evening. The kind of disappearing that we're practicing this evening is the disappearing that Jad was talking about nearer to the end. The disappearing in which we're willing to let go. We're willing to let go of what we value most. We're willing to let go of that. We're willing to drop those things. We're willing to no longer accumulate what we want. We're willing to find a different kind of happiness in which we aren't the center of attention. A kind of happiness in which we aren't, as Lida likes to say, performing a solo. <coughs> We're not, she's a dance instructor, helps us out a lot here at the Center for Mindful Learning, and she says, when you dance, you should never be performing a solo. You're always equal with all of the different people and things you're dancing with. We have that direct experience in which we're equal with each of those sounds. It's not that I'm listening to the sound. It's just a sound. And we find, in fact, that that is our experience. If you listen to a sound, you'll find that when you hear it, at the moment of hearing it, it is, there isn't the experience, I'm listening to a sound. It's just a sound. That's it. There is no special location in the universe where I am. I'm not the center of things. There's just a sound occurring. And we have that direct experience and have that experience of dropping and dropping and dropping. And if we practice that and practice it and practice it and practice it and practice it and practice it, then under those circumstances, the love that we feel for nature and each other and ourselves, then that love can manifest in a way that is deeply caring. But if we're not willing to let go then the love that we have, which is valid and legitimate and good, can easily I don't take this too strongly, but to be honest, it can easily do damage. And I need to be honest with you about that because I've experienced that. I've experienced what it's like to care for someone, myself or others, and find that that caring didn't help. That can happen. It can happen. I know what it's like to have that happen. And I know other people who know what it's like to have that happen. And so we have to be very careful. What is it like to have the humility to drop away? To have the humility to totally drop away. What would it be like to have a path that allowed us to practice disappearing? Not once, not twice, but hundreds of times an hour. To practice disappearing. To notice, oh, here I am, thinking about myself, and oh, just like that. Just gone. Just gone. To experience that. And to notice that it's not so bad. It's not so bad to disappear. It isn't that bad. We vanish. And not only do we disappear, but the people who we know disappear at that moment. 
Yeah, the moment we hear that sound, there's no one in this room, including ourselves. Pay attention. At the moment of hearing it, that's the only thing there is. Everyone's gone. We're gone. Everyone's gone. And yet, it's not so bad. It's not so bad, which means that we don't need those things. At that moment, that we hear we don't have a car, we don't have a job, we don't have a past, we don't have a future. We don't have anything, and it's not so bad, which means that we don't need those things. In fact, at that moment, we don't even have a life, which means that we don't need to be alive. We don't need it. And human beings have a great addiction to being alive. A great addiction to that, which is endangering life on this planet. We have a great addiction to being alive. But as far as I can tell, there's something that we have an even greater addiction to than being alive. Which may seem terrifying, but I, as far as I can tell, there's something even more than that. <coughs> have an addiction to being right. Mm -hmm. But at the moment of hearing that sound, we're not right. And we're not wrong. There's just a sound. There's just a sound. Our addiction to being right isn't a matter of doing what we know is right. That is something different. I'm not saying that having a sense of conscience and ethics is a bad thing. I'm talking about an addiction. And the addiction to being right, an unwillingness to be wrong, uh, causes conflict. It does. It causes conflict. We stab up, we stab each other with verbal daggers, as they say, when we think you're wrong and I'm right. Only this is true, everything else is wrong. And sometimes we stab each other with physical daggers. And sometimes we make bombs and we cut off limbs and heads. And sometimes we make them through weapons and kill innocent people. And sometimes we then keep on building nuclear weapons. Don't we? And so what would it be like to practice, to actually practice no longer holding on to any of those needs? It doesn't mean that we become less capable of behaving in an effective and productive way. On the contrary, it enables us to to observe possible behaviors from a place in which we don't need any of those things to be right or to happen for our own happiness. Because we know, I've experienced once, twice, a hundred times, a thousand times, a million times, what it's like to, to drop away, to disappear. We actually experience it. It's just, you just listen to the sound. At that moment, you're gone, which means you don't have need. And it's not that bad. In fact, there's a joy in it. There's a love in it. That's inexplicable. And yet, apparently inexhaustible. Every time, it's there. We didn't make it. It didn't seem to require any of our energy or intention. It's just there. It arose. And when we have access to that kind of happiness, then no longer will our views on right and wrong be as biased by what we want to be right so that I can get what I want. I hope that this is clear. It's very important to see this clearly. We, we have a tendency to be biased. <laughs> uh, sorry if that's disappointing, but we do. We, we sometimes are biased. It's really hard for us to see things in an unbiased way. It's just, or I shouldn't say hard, but rare. Let me say that way. It's not really hard, but it's rare for human beings to see things in an unbiased way. It requires an enormous amount of honesty and humility in order to do that. And if we can't do that, then 
We know it's hard to know. I think this is the right thing to do, but maybe I'm biased. Maybe this is just the way of doing things that will make things be the way I, I want them to be. Is that really the best? Well, I, it's hard to know. So we practice disappearing. We practice that, the direct experience of disappearing, to confirm, without a doubt, that I actually don't need this to be in any particular way to be happy. I have a kind of happiness that doesn't require things to be a certain way. Because I have experienced the absolute vanishing. The vanishing of myself, the vanishing of my loved ones, the vanishing of my philosophies and worldviews and political stances. And spiritual beliefs. All of that, gone. And yet, there's a joy. Isn't there? You listen, listen to them. Is there not? It's right there, arising, mysteriously. Just because we're forgotten, the lilies bloom. It's absolutely magnificent. And we learn that this is something that we can, that, that this is something that can inform us. It's another option of information than, boy, I wish things were this way so that I could be happy. It's very difficult sometimes for us to distinguish between our conscience, my conscience is leading me to do such and such, and, well, I want things to be this way. So I'm going to try to get it to be that way. It can be very difficult to distinguish, to disentangle our conscience, our sense of ethics, from our desires and our beliefs and our opinions. Very difficult sometimes to disentangle that. And so we experience something in which we are certain, we're certain, that there are no beliefs and opinions and needs. What is that? It's called disappearing. We vanish. We hear that sound. And in that moment, we have vanished. At that moment, gone. We're gone. We're gone. We experience that again and again in order to allow ourselves to use our lives as a canvas for the art of behavior. We can use the opportunities we have each day as a way to, to skillfully and lovingly and, yes, selflessly think, speak, and act. We learn how to do that so that we, here we are in the world, not in a cave. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's wonderful if, to be in a cave. But we aren't. We're here. And so here we are. How can we make our behavior into a spiritual practice? How can we make our behavior into an art? How can we make our behavior into a manifestation of our spiritual realization? That's our challenge as people living under, who have chosen, none of you were forced to be here, you could have gone into the mountains. No one has been forced to be here. You're perfectly free to choose a different lifestyle, but here we are. We have chosen this lifestyle. And so how do we take responsibility for that decision? We find a way to make our behavior, interaction with the world into, as I like to say, an art, into a spiritual practice, into a manifestation of responsibility, of ethics, of love, of compassion, and of selflessness. We find ways of doing that. It isn't something that we can say, we did it. It's, it's, it's a journey, it's something that we find a new way in the morning, and another new way in the late morning, and another new way at noon, and another new way in the early afternoon, again and again, finding new ways of fully manifesting the love that we have for all living things. So please make use, in order to augment the general spiritual practice which we here have, which is our behavior, with a kind of total non-behavior. A total non-doing of simply disappearing. It's not mystical and far away. It's not some other thing off in the distance. The moment you hear the bird, the cricket, someone breathing, the moment you hear that, you're gone. Take advantage of that opportunity to deeply cultivate the freedom 
to do what we know is right.